now just about to start with our program. Um, my name is Mukhala Madise. Uh, I'm a coordinator for masters and doctoral uh, qualifications in the College of Human Sciences. And um, I will be a program director for today. Just before I welcome everyone of you, I just want to give some uh, house rules. First, let's all switch off our cell, cell phones or maybe put them on silent. And secondly, for those of you who are not familiar with the places, if you're looking for bathrooms, they are right at the bed. You just move towards the exit door on your left side. The bathrooms are that side. Without wasting any time, let me first acknowledge the presence of our executive dean, Professor Gosi, our um, head of research and graduate studies, Professor Mabandi Mujusi, and then I will also welcome, or maybe even to acknowledge our esteemed guest, Professor Jonathan Chimakona, who is from the University of Victoria. He will be our main guest speaker, and the respondent will be Ms. Gugu Ndazi. She is basically one of our members, or our staff members. Now, without wasting any time, we'll get the, uh, straight to our uh, program where I'm going to invite Professor Mkosi, our executive dean, to come and welcome our guests as well as all the members who are here. Thank you. Thank you, Program Director. As is we in Bogoto, we're coming from the Women's Day yesterday. May I hear your voices? Yes, yes. May I hear the postdoc? Where are the postdoc? Uh -uh, you unulate with your style of postdoc. Yes. May we hear the noise from the males who are always supporting the females? Morning, colleagues. Uh, thank you very much for gracing our event. It's highly appreciated. When uh, Prof. Madise was acknowledging, he forgot Prof. Sekali, who is the chair of Chief Albert Lutuli. Thank you very much, Prof. Sekali. We appreciate your support. He, he, she's really leading the chair, and she's doing so well. Um, Yesterday we celebrated uh, Women's Day. There were different events that were held in different locations, but we are still yearning for our colleagues to take us seriously. We are still suffering, but in the next two hours, we're going to forget our misery and focus on our Africa Sweep event. For people who are new at UNISA, this is the legacy project which was started by our Executive Dean Prof. Rosemary Mogezi. She had a vision of ensuring that we move in a deep colonial space, taking our scholarship with. So the project started in 20, 2008. This year, it's 2023. It means it's a 15-year project. This year, UNISA is 150 years old. So you can see the relationship a 15-year project, we are celebrating 150 years. There is this 15 that is common. For lots of players, please go and put 15. Yes. So I'm giving you two numbers. I'm giving you 15. I'm giving you six because if you say one plus five is six, if you win, then 10% goes through the College of Human Sciences. 
So her vision was to nurture and develop and sustain a vibrant community of researchers. We are having a head of research and innovation for the College of Human Sciences because what we are doing here as Africa Speaks, it needs to talk to our research. We need ideas on how we can really ensure that our thoughts are acknowledged wherever we are. So she wanted us to be creative, to be those innovators, and also when you ask about knowledge, they say knowledge is true, but based on his idea. When we talk about UNISA, we always talk about student-centric uh, knowledge. Do we ever involve our students in how we engage and design our curriculum? This was the vision of Prof. Rosemary McGate. We really appreciate. She's still part of the college. She's still assisting us. And we say we need to move. In terms of transformation, we also need to make sure that as much as we're in Africa, our innovation must be acknowledged all over the world. So this is the space where we need to develop critical thinking and make sure that we challenge the colonial thoughts. This Africa Speaks assists us in transforming our teaching and learning. The knowledge that is generated needs to be acknowledged that it's coming from diverse backgrounds. I always believe that people are unique yet we need to treat them equally. We need to hear all those voices. And as we are recalculating as the College of Human Sciences, we are going to learn a lot from the message that will be shared today. Our keynote speaker is Prof. Jonathan Chimakoman from UP, but I don't want to take the shine out of Ms. Mokupi. I just want to leave it for Ms. Mokupi, who is leading our transformation unit. So colleagues, welcome to this event. And we are looking forward to the discussions that are going to take place. And also we'll be engaging both the keynote speaker and our respondent, Ms. Kukundanzi, from the Department of Systematic Theology, Practical Theology, Philosophy. It's one department that is this. So colleagues, thank you very much for your attendance. We are looking forward to the discussions and then let the discussions begin. Thank you, Program Director. Thank you, Professor Nkosi, for the warm welcome as well as Um, without wasting any time, I'm going to ask Ms. Mokopi to come forward to welcome, uh, with, rather not to welcome, but to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Ms. Mokopi, as Dr. Professor Mokopi has already said, is our um, transformation officer in the College of Human Sciences. So, Ms. Mokopi, please ask her to Professor Sankosi and the entire College Management Committee, colleagues, good morning. What I'm going to do is easy. I'm going to introduce who by now is our guest speaker, but by the end of the day, he'll be part of the family. Professor Jonathan Chimakonam teaches at the University of Pretoria, South Africa. He taught at the University of Calabar, Nigeria for several years. He was a senior research fellow at the Center for Interdisciplinary and Intercultural Philosophy at the Hart Karls University of Tübingen, Germany. From 2021 to 2022, he was a research associate at the University of Johannesburg from 2017 to 2018. His teaching and research interests include African philosophy, logic, environmental ethics, epistemic justice, and decolonial thinking. He aims to break new grounds in African philosophy by developing a theory that unveils new concepts and opens new vistas for thought, conversational philosophy, a method that can drive theories in African philosophy and beyond conventional conversational thinking, 
and a system of logic that grounds both is amazing. Chimakonam has contributed several concepts and principles to African philosophy and thought. These articles have appeared in refer lectures organized at universities, universities around the world. He is the convener of the Conversational Society of Philosophy and the founding editor of Philosophia Theoretica, Journal of African Philosophy, Culture and Religions. He was a recipient of the University of Pretoria's Exceptional Young Researcher, Researcher, Researcher's Award in 2021, and in, in 2022, he won the University of Pretoria Vice Chancellor's Book Award. In 2016, he was a recipient of the ISUD's Outstanding Research in Philosophy Award. He is African philosophy, he is African philosophy area editor in the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. He is part of some ongoing research collaborations with scholars from other countries, including a John Templeton Foundation funded project. His book on Ezumezu logic is currently being translated into Chinese and Portuguese languages. Shima Konam is a member of about a dozen professional philosophy bodies. He has a passion for mentoring young students and colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mokubi, with that brief um, introduction of, of Professor Jonathan Shima um, without wasting any time, I'm going to invite our guest speaker, Professor Chima Bonam, to the stage to come and speak to us on Africa Speaks. And just before he comes, um, I just want to say this, this I can't prove it from Ghana that says, if you can't speak for yourself, the fish from the sea will speak for you. Hence, the lecture or lecture series on Africa speaks. It's about Africa and to speak for So Z2 Nkosi, Dean College of Human Sciences, Professor Magnuse, Professor Mungu, I hope I got the name correct, please forgive me. Okay, Azul, and the professor that joined us from Alpha B2. Officers of the college that I do not have the privilege yet to know, colleagues, distinguished members of the audience, thank you. Abdul, 
those who have joined us online, I believe is Evangelist Ministry Live on YouTube. Thank you for making out your time to listen to me. The Africa Speaks Lecture Service is an appealing one. Let me try to find myself within one hour that I intend to speak. If you are not ready to be here in this great hall named after the famous and great African intellectual Mary Martin. I also feel honored to be speaking at the University of South Africa in the very year that it clocked 150 years. That is some record for a university on the African continent. This university has educated hundreds of thousands of people from this continent and beyond. I believe about 130 countries. That is a great feat. And I am honored to be marginally associated with such a great university today. It has survived a lot and it will continue to survive more. So today I want to talk on a topic that has concerned me and bothered me for some time. And I believe in the course of this talk perhaps you will hear something that reminds you of things that are also things that concern you and bother you about Africa and Africans. My topic will be the communal contract and the African condition. We can garnish it with a rider how the communal ideology impedes Africa's progress. My talk will be divided into five parts. First part, I'll be looking at the problem of this very lecture, the gap in the literature and research, the leading questions that will inform my ideas today, and a set of hypotheses I have formulated to explain. And then I will speak and partly read the part five. I prepared uh, prepared slides for us, but I can see that we will not be uh, using that technology. were several miles behind Europe, as at the time the Europeans 
made their incursion into this continent. Why? Why is it that many African countries today can't seem to get things right? Why? Why is it that many Africans can't seem to do the right things? inspired me to investigate this very topic. And that leads me to the problems that I set out for myself. Number one, almost everyone in this room today, including those joining from different places, have regularly wondered why many, Af many Native Africans today chorus brotherhood, communalism, sharing, caring, love, Ubuntu, but our daily attitude and behavior towards one another are hardly brotherly, nor do they reflect caring, sharing, and mutual love, let alone Ubuntu. For full disclosure, the Africa I speak about today is not the entire continent. I speak about the parts of Africa where you find people who look like me. This problem is the PhD problem, pull him down syndrome, that pervades many African societies. Some have claimed that the evils of slavery, colonialism, racialism, and apartheid broke our moral fiber. Others have argued that Western rotten individualistic vices in their various depraved forms have corrupted our values. Still, some others have argued that African communalism it's a relic ideology that is unsuitable for modern life. Friends, whilst I will not deny these accusations nor attempt to defend the indefensible cultural and psychic damage dealt on our people by ungodly and depraved colonial antagonists, I will attempt to demonstrate that the most significant damage our people have suffered and continue to suffer to this day was brought about by our own devices. And I've couched it as the communal contract. I will come to it. Fashioned in the ancient time by our parents, a thousand years, two thousand years, how many thousands of years ago? But imbued with something that made it inhibit progress. I will come to that. Number two. Some people in this room may have noticed that the only occasion when most Native Africans work together is usually to fight off a common threat. Real or imagining, external or internal. If they were in government, civil service, parliament, military, corporate world, sports team, or even in academia, they could quickly organize to put down a perceived common threat under a pretentious banner of brotherhood. But many of us seldom work together to bring about their own development, progress, prosperity, and fulfill their individual needs. Orchestrate something big. I call this negative solidarity. And I distinguish it from positive solidarity. By negative solidarity, I mean coming together once in a while, whenever a perceived threat arises, for the sole purpose of fighting off a common threat. Negative solidarity. For positive solidarity, this define it as working together always, not once in a while, 
all ways for development, progress, prosperity, and fulfillment of individual needs. So when a people come together who are utilizing solidarity and decide to find ways to develop, to create uh, industrialization in their society, you have to look for talents amongst them who can fashion different technologies. Give them whatever they need and whatever support they need. Bring them together to create big technologies, big moves, big developments, whatever. That's positive solidarity. They do it all the time. Not because of the interest of the community as a whole. No, that's a fast. For, the, for their own individual needs. These are two different mentalities, negative and positive solidarities. The backbone of African communal contract that our people entered into in the ancient times by my research and imagination is negative solidarity. Unfortunately, it continues to shape our thinking to this day, and I'll explain why. Number three, some of us in this room may have wondered at some point why many African leaders since the end of colonialism attempted, are attempting or succeeded in perpetuating themselves in power. Despite the people-driven manifestos, promises and liberal constitutions, some may have wondered why many African politicians lose so much money that they will ever need in multiple lifetimes. And yet, when they have another day in power, they lose some more. Others may have also wondered why socialism and democracy failed in Africa, because they have failed. Despite the claim that the African communalism was the boyhood of socialism and democracy. If it was the boyhood of socialism and democracy, then it shouldn't be a problem for Africa to implement socialism or democracy. Why is it a problem? Further, there may be others in this room who wonder why, despite the sheer devastating experiences of slavery, racialism, colonialism, apartheid, that many African societies today continue to be polarized by trivial concerns such as ethnicism, Afrophobia, religious bigotry, <laughs> And so on. I associate these with what I will de describe and explain today as failure of citizenship and crisis of thought. This will all be part of what I will propose and explain in the last part of this talk. Before then, I trace the problems, these problems I've des described now, to one very idea I describe as communalysis. Communalysis is a trauma-induced obsession with the precept of the communal contract. And that precept is a negative solidarity. The implication here is that there is something fundamentally wrong with the brand of communalism devised in ancient Africa. Something fundamentally wrong with it. Because once a society reaches the collective stage, that is community, it becomes a basis for a speedy progress. Why did that not happen in Africa? Every society around the world passed through the stage of the hunter-gatherer family, and then it takes a long time before the community. And then from there, that's a speedy progress. Why did Africa reach that communal level and literally started sleeping until the Europeans came and we were vulnerable when they came. So I will make a bold claim that the error, that thing that is fundamentally wrong with the brand of communalism devised in Africa, 
It's so fundamental that it has continued to determine the history of Africa ever since. Now, I'll explain why. Without this fundamental error in the formation of the Asian African community, Africa would probably not have been enslaved, colonized, and racialized against. If the Europeans who made incursions into this, uh, co this continent in the 14th, 15th century had arrived and met wonderful, awe-inspiring civilizations from west to east to south, where how would they begin to even imagine the idea that they were superior? They would, be, they would, have, been, they would have been wowed to the point of thinking, what can we learn from these people and take back home? They would have been pupils rather than masters. But the condition they met our people when they came in many parts of Africa inspired them to imagine quite an error, of course, to have this baseless sense of, inflated sense of themselves, began to imagine that they were superior. The moment that happened, slavery was only a time, it was only a matter of time before slavery started. And from slavery, colonialism, and from colonialism, neocolonialism, and the isms continue. There probably would not have been European settlers in South, Southern and East Africa. No land dispossession, no apartheid, and probably no Robert Mugabe. If they had met Africa, if the community we founded was the type that enabled us to make exponent, uh, standing progress, like in some other places, like Europe. That error is, as I have stated above, the formation of the Asian African community in which members were imbued with the mentality that the only time they where to work together was mainly to fight off common threats. Besides that, everyone was to fend for themselves according to their own ability. Civilized, no civilization was built, was ever built by individuals who work on their own. No, no one. And no civilization was ever built by people who only come together when there's an enemy to fight. None. Many African scholars, and this leads me to the gap in the literature, many African scholars claim that the basic ontological and sociopolitical tenet of the culture, most of the cultures out of the Sahara is communalistic. And you find this in numerous literature from philosophy to sociology to anthropology to cultural studies and what have you. Some notable scholars would include uh, John Mbiti, if I in and recently, Polika Pikwet, I've to mention, but a few. Before these people, there were even some African scholars who had articulated that African communalism into a brand of socialism they call African socialism. You see that in the works of Leopold Senghor and uh, Julius Nyerere. Some have even teased this African communalism as Ubuntu. And you see that in the works of Kageme, Jan, Samkangi, and Samkangi, Bengu, and a host of others. Others have articulated it as you come out relationship. You see that in the works of um, Rovi and Masaka and the rest of them. Yet others have explicated it in terms of Umunna, Ebwe Beru Gubere, or Hakarasi, or consensus. You see that in the works of Unjaka, 74, Nwala, 85, Rebu, 95, we read 93, 96. <laughs> There were quite a number of them, yet there are people who have challenged the veracity and modern viability of African communal ideology. These are the critics. That would include Wiredu, 2018, Matilina Nkwindingwe, 2013, and recently, Taiwo, 2016. But despite their both 
positions on African communalism, to the best of my knowledge, no one has attempted to investigate and interrogate the contractual origins of the African communal worldview, from which they derive their philosophical interpretations, uh, presentations, articulations, ap applications, and criticism thereof. This is the major gap. If we value African communalism the way we romanticize it everywhere, then as scholars, we owe a duty to probe deeper, dig deeper, beyond this, the surface, trace the origin of these values, and how uh, the circumstances that led to the formulation of this value, the nature of this our African communalism, whether it is the same with the type of communalism practiced elsewhere in the world. Africa was not the only communal society. It's a stage of development, and every society passed through it. Asian Africans gave themselves a communal contract as a product of my research by articulating a set of norms to control the freedoms of individuals. And I'll explain why I think this is the case. This was the case. Thus, the foremost African community most likely emerged by default rather than by design. But this communal contract must have been instigated by a series of traumatic experiences that resulted from the organic exercise of unlimited human freedoms in the ancient times. The latter must have led to the emergence of strong individuals who left carnage, mayhem, and wanton destruction in their trail. People who realized their freedom and used it however they liked when they had not developed a sense of responsibility. Imagine the type of damage, blood, carnage that that would have led to. The trauma that would have caused, the fear that compelled people to say, okay, let's come together and stop this. If we grant the above imagination, then Asian Africans must have been so traumatized that they understood the norms as that they formulated that they entered the age of community as rejected. Any conduct that highlighted individual ambition and glory could easily have been interpreted as reminiscent of the strongman mentality which, with which everyone exercised their unlimited freedom prior to the age of community. It will not be difficult to imagine that this sort of conduct under such a climate would have been viciously put down and collectively condemned. This also meant that the ancient African community abhorred growth, even if unwittingly, and made progress difficult. But we can also imagine that the creation of the ancient African community must have brought some benefits too. At that time, for one, it must have brought the carnage to a bare minimum and enthroned reasonable stability and peace. For thee, for one, the, that alone can be regarded as a significant positive, without which no progress of any sort can be contemplated in such a community. But why did the ancient African community not make significant progress following its formation? Why did it not make significant progress? I will construct a socio-political and psychological theory to explain this. I am not saying that the Asian African community did not make progress. Of course it did, in the areas of arts, crafts, healing sciences, even technologies of all kinds. Okay? Hundreds of years ago, people in West African societies had already de developed technologies for processing palm oil. But it is, it was, it's most likely something developed by one person, and then he, he, he shares it with his neighbor and friends, and before long, it's everywhere. So different families could process as much as they have and take to the market to sell or butter. That was still, they could not get this to an industrial scale level. They couldn't come together as a community to say, all right, why don't we cultivate the largest mass of land of palms? Why don't we? set up a group of people, the best minds amongst us, and task them to develop better, more sophisticated, bigger technology that could process larger volumes of oil in short time. 
That is positive solidarity. So you see, whatever accomplishments in most African communities, I am not saying all. There are some communities that actually were better off and far advanced than others, especially those who had kings and emperors with dictatorial powers. So there was progress in some areas, but it wasn't enough. And they remained mostly at individual level. At least Africa of the 80s was not at the same level with Europe when Europe came. Some could say that the gap was too wide, which made slavery and colonialism possible. For example, in the 18th century, the British settlers in Cape Town had guns, cannons, ships, boots, and soldiers who had been taught the strategies of warfare. While our own King Shaka and his people had spears and no shoes. So despite their great numerical advantage, they stood no chance. At his peak, King Shaka's army was believed to number up to 100,000. Yet the British, who number in a few thousands, two or three thousands, defeated them. They stood no chance. When the Europeans came, they did not come in hundreds of thousands. They came in tens and hundreds, yet they conquered, subdued us, and took many of us and sold as slaves in their countries and elsewhere in the New World. We stood no chance. We were so backward because our community did, was not the type that encouraged progress. So when we echo African communalism, African brotherhood and all that, let us know what it really was like and how it is hurting us today. So my hypothesis is as follows that the milieu of fear and carnage that preceded the formation of the Asian African community must have inflicted severe traumas and mutual distrust if people had come together to set up that community. And the idea why they agreed to that was to stop, was out of fear of how they had destroyed themselves, killing all kinds of things. The mutual distrust to survive. Such that members of this ancient community found themselves to be innocent. Their contract was imbued innocently with negative solidarity. Not B. The members of this community became so afraid of strong individuals that genius, strength, Heroism, ambition, merit, distinction, extraordinary efforts, and even excellence must have been mistakenly, okay, mistaken you know, and associated with the apparitions of strong individuals. So they are afraid of strong individuals who use their strength to murder and take a maim to the point that they begin to clip the wings of individuals who've got ambition You've got genius, you've got strength. Everything that highlights the individual becomes a negative that must be suppressed. Yet, in weeding off the evil ones, they also suppressed the good qualities that would have driven their communities forward. From A and B above, the Asian African community became one in which members mainly understood communal life as one where they worked together to fight a common threat. Besides that, everyone simply had to crawl towards their individual needs at their own pace. And as an individual, you can't go far. That's only how far you can go. They, that the experiences of slavery were now in the new age. The experiences of slavery, colonialism, racialism, and apartheid and the reality of African accomplices to some of these evils 
must have again inflicted new rounds of trauma to modern Africans and distrust, mutual distrust of members of the post-colonial African community. That the only time they could work together was mainly to fight off a common threat. From South Africa to Zambia, from Zimbabwe to Nigeria, from Cote d'Ivoire to the Congo, most times when Africans come together is when they think that a common threat has arisen. After that, everyone goes about their business. Negative solidarity doesn't engender progress. So, now having set the tone of my research, let me speak to the next three parts and then conclude quickly with the last part. The next part is the communal contract and the emergence of the first African community. How did the first African community emerge? Surely, there must have been a, a, a point when African communalism as an ideology came up. There must have been a point where Africans moved from the family unit to the community level of social development. That must have been. Yes, no, let's imagine what it was like. Let's also imagine the circumstances that led them to the formation of that first community. Let's imagine the psychological state of those who formed that community, who articulated the norms that became that ideology, that contract. And I, and as I was doing this research and reading all kinds of things and thinking as philosophers do, putting things into logical perspective, I realized that there's even a strong gap, even as we discuss African communalism today. Most people always start from the ethical precept that African communalism is made up of norms, norms that guided moral conduct. Hey, okay, that is true with the age of community, yes, but prior to the age of community, what do we have? Before the first humans came together to form the norms, what did we have? Because the community was an important stage that must be in place before you get to the community. The family was an important stage that must be in place before the community could be set up. What was it like? We can imagine a large expanse of land where people lived in isolated spots. Population was quite far lower than it is today on this continent. So you can imagine Biology kicking in and working is magic. Males and females meeting and then having babies and raising them from hunter gatherer, human patient man and woman, to the family man and woman, the children who grow up to be sent forth, the man to be sent forth to establish himself and find himself a wife or wives, the woman to be sent to be married up to another man who comes by. These sort of arrangement that led to the formation of the African family unit system that developed eventually that to marry someone's daughter, you have to pay labola. Most of the cultures in Southern Africa, Kurashia in Eastern Africa, you may go in West Africa and the rest of them. And the similarity of these cultural practices they begin to string together. And I thought to myself, some norms guided them, even though nobody articulated them. And because nobody articulated those norms that guided the formation of those family units and how they related amongst themselves, I decided to name them basic norms. Basic norm one, basic norm two, guided how families are set up, and how those children go up to set up their own families. And those where the, those things happen at the age of innocence. When most people on this continent, in those ancient times, didn't have a sense of property, ownership. Based on human emotions like greed, and avarice, and jealousy were not there. There's nobody to compete with. Everybody tried to make a living from nature. 
and was happy to sight another human being in two months or one, one year. But imagine when population started growing and many more people started dotting the same landscape that people could now see their neighbor not far off or trek a, a, a mile and see another neighbor. When people started having a sense of ownership and say, okay, this is mine, don't come here to hunt. That's my stream, don't fetch water there. Imagine when that starts happening. At a point, something must have triggered violence. Something must have triggered people realizing that they have freedom. As at this time, no one had any idea of freedom. We can imagine that. Imagine a man walking by and seeing his neighbor come home with a beautiful maiden, far prettier than his own wife. <laughs> no laws, no punishments, no law enforcers, nothing. And he looks at himself, he thinks he's huge and stronger than the man who now has far prettier maiden. What do you think will happen in the mind of that man? If he resisted it one day and one week, by the next month he will walk across to that man's house and drag that median. What would that man do? He will respond by fighting to keep his wife. And they will fight to the death. Because he's stronger, he succeeds in killing this one and drags off the woman as his own. He's not afraid of repercussion. There was nothing like that. No laws, no police. He must have realized his freedom. He must have felt good. I don't even have to go and fight with lions before I could kill a game and bring home. I could simply wait here and take from those who have hunted. The realization of freedom without knowledge of responsibility. And this, before you know it, we can imagine must have become a norm. People started doing it everywhere. Carnage, destruction, murder, everywhere. People thought this was the way to live. Must have thought this was the way to live at that stage. Until it will begin to, because if you have succeeded in killing people and taking from there, on one day you meet your match, who will deal with you so much that if you survive it, you'll be left with new knowledge that, hey, not just me who can take whatever I want. There are other people who can do that as well. Someone must have at some point thought of, we can stop this by agreeing not to take what belongs to one another. And he must have shared it with some persons who will accept, some who will just ignore him. But at some point, he must have taken years, decades, even centuries and the fear and the terror must have compelled people to say, okay, let us come together and reason this thing. And then they decide to make a set of norms. What do you think was the psychological state of those people? The norms they were coming to make, most of them would strictly be to clip the wings of one another. They were, focused, they were not interested in forming community. They probably didn't know what, that they were forming a community. They wanted to make a law to prevent one another from killing and destroying one another. So that the community becomes for them a fortress where they can find peace, where they can find stability. Not knowing that for those little trivial things that the community offered, that those set of contract, that set contract, those set of norms they articulated, for the good things it offered them, it took far more away. Because from then on, when someone tries to highlight, highlight his or her individuality, there would always be someone that would say, hey, watch him. That was how Okunkwa behaved the other day before he cut off someone's head. So the same communal contract became the inhibitor of progress. This must have been what? And I am not trying to tell you to agree with me. I want us to debate. This debate could linger for years. 
but bring a better alternative too. Let us explain why Africa was so backward as at the time the Europeans arrived. As intellectuals, it's our duty to find an explanation and many, as many explanation models are allowed. So you see, the age of innocence ended and the age of corruption where anybody who had the means took whatever he wanted or she wanted from anyone. I call that the age of corruption. And the norm that governed that, it was not articulated by anyone, but everyone must have understood it and thought that that was how the world worked. I described it as the basic norm three. But at some point, when it became obsolete, when people gathered and formed articulated norms that formed the first community, the basic norm three became obsolete, and we had the communal norms, the ones that you are likely to see in literature everywhere. It was not the first. But the contract was woven too tightly and imbued with negative solidarity. So any time they came together was to fight off a common threat. The contract was to enable everyone to go about their own business, unperturbed. And because of the mutual distrust, because you are in that contract with someone who had killed your son and your daughter, you don't trust him. Couldn't even think of, hey, let us convert this solidarity into something positive. And this African communalism became an instrument of repression and control. As I move forward to the last part of this talk, communalysis as a contemporary psychosocial consequence of the ancient communal contract, the African condition today. I define communalism fully here. I had given you brief definitions elsewhere. As a trauma-induced obsession. Now you understand what the trauma I was talking about. In the ancient time, the trauma of the carnage that precipitated the formation of the community. But in this modern time, new rounds of trauma arose from the terrible, humiliating, and evil effects of racism, colonialism, apartheid, and a host of others. So I say that communalysis is a trauma-induced obsession that compels its victims to mentally run back to the ancient African communal fortress, from the safety of which they can rebel and collectively fight off oppressive ideologies and ideologues as common threats. Communalysis, as a condition that many Africans today suffer without knowing it. Many of us suffer this condition without knowing it. How eager are we to fly back to the ancient African communal fortress? Why? Because that fortress provided peace and calm and safety from the carnage and destruction from everybody against everybody. The humiliating effect, the knowledge, the awareness that racialism, colonialism, apathy, and slavery, that these things were humiliating to us. The moment we we'll run into something from the evil perpetrators, the perpetrators of these evils, we don't want to accept that there's anything good that can come from them because of the humiliation. And then you see us run back to the fortress of the ancient African community. We scream Ubuntu, we scream. We come out, we scream African this, African that, African brotherhood, African that. But we don't practice those things because we don't really mean them. It was a facade. And I'll explain that. So the wall of that fortress enables us to give a facade 
to outsiders that we are a people who practice common brotherhood. But inside that wall, we antagonize and destroy each other. On each occasion, when we gather together to fight off another enemy or threat, other Africans who did not join in that flight back to that African communal fortress are easily ostracized and called all kinds of names. In the ancient time, to be ostracized from that community is to be left alone and to suffer and die because people who don't care, people who strong individuals who are roaming about will tear you to shred and nothing, nothing, nobody will protect you. That community offered protection. In the ancient Africa, to ostracize someone from the community was the greatest punishment you could give to that person. In today's Africa, to discount someone as non-African, you're not a brother, and call them all kinds of names, perpetrators of these intended to have similar effects, and in most cases it does. So I describe communalysis as a condition because it has become pathological. My effort here will be to diagnose a psychological, sociocultural, and intellectual condition affecting many Africans, African individuals or persons today. So my diagnosis affects Africans as individuals, not African states. There's nothing wrong with African states. The problem we have in Africa are the citizens, not the countries, not the states. The states are not human beings, are the citizens. If the institutions and organs of the state are managed by citizens who suffer certain psychological, sociocultural, and intellectual pathology, then we can expect the condition of such a state to be dire. No one gives what he does not have. Communalysis, thus, is a syndrome with a host of associated symptoms that turn citizens into agents of social, political, and economic disaster. And I'll explain that in the next stage. Collectively and individually, victims of communalysis judge will and act in ways that hinder progress in society. These symptoms can be grouped into two categories, social and psychological. For the social category, we have what I mentioned earlier, failure of citizenship and crisis of thought. Crisis of thought. Following a long colonial cultural harassment and bombardment, our necks have twisted to face backwards, such that while we walk on the tracks of individualistic ontology, liberal democracy and all kinds of things, our gaze is always fixed on the shadows of communal ideology. We are in democracy walking this way, but our gaze is fixed backwards on communal, commun communal, African communalism. So democracy says, by principle of rule of law, that everyone must be treated equally before the law. But African communalism that our necks are twisted backwards to face will remind us that that person is our brother, speaks the same language with us, from the same ethnic nationality, from the same racial group even, that the cases like South Africa and, and elsewhere, or even attends the same church with me. These things play serious roles to subvert democracy. How can democracy work? Crisis of thought. We subscribe to democracy, liberal democracy, but, we, you, but our actions negate the same principles. We preach, on the other side, we preach communalism, yet our actions negate the same principles. Crisis of thought. You say one thing, you do another. You believe one thing, you act another. When someone from South Africa or Kenya runs into the man who comes from the Congo or Zimbabwe, they call each other brothers. Then the next day, when one sees the other striving to achieve something important, he shoots him down. Why? 
Because in the African community, everyone must be equal. No penguin should wear a different stripe. Difference is a crime. Don't be different. There is mutual distrust amongst people who are supposed to be practicing common brotherhood. We trumpet the eponymous values of communalism, but act the vilest, vilest form of individualism. In our thinking, we are always confused about what we want and what we need. For example, we need to support and promote each other and their businesses. But I want him, him and her and her not to grow. We need to provide public infrastructure, accountability and security but I want a chunk of that money to myself and my family. Crisis of thought. We think like children, speak like angels, and act like monsters. Crisis of thought. Sometimes we don't even recognize ourselves from our thoughts. And because of this confusion, we can hardly see far into the future, nor envisage the future consequences of our today's actions and inactions. Someone, some people failed to build new power stations in this country when it was time to do so. Some people failed to modernize existing power stations when it was time to do so. Hey, we still have 24 hours power, so what was the need? They could not see the future consequences of their actions and inactions of that day. They did not know that population will grow. They did not go know that industrialization will continue to grow. They did not know that those, those um, installations would decay. All of a sudden, we are where we are today in South Africa. Crisis of thought. We cannot plan, let alone work together and we hardly can make informed decisions on matters of concern due to communal baggage that we carry with us. How many times have you turned on the TV and you heard that a number of African brothers are combining to establish a consortium that will create 100,000 jobs? How many times have you turned down, turned the news to see that? Most times you see about African brothers and sisters coming together as always to fight and to defend. Negative solidarity. Failure of citizenship. And this is very important because it concerns all of us. It's always easy for us to point fingers to those who destroyed South Africa, the leaders, to the corrupt leaders that destroyed Nigeria, my country. It's always easy to point to the dictators and those who perpetrated themselves in governments and looted their country is down. It's always easy to do that. What we forget most times is that it is a failed citizenship that produced those rotten leaders. So because those who manifest the first symptom of crisis of thought are citizens of various states in Africa, it would appear as if the problem is with the dysfunctional states rather than the citizens. This leads to the delusion that if appropriate programs are put in place and implemented in the political, economic, cultural, legal, and world view, that the fortunes of, of the affected states will inevitably turn around. It's not true. It's a short-sightedness it's, 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 it's short, short, is alarming, to say the least. The people of African nations today, those people are not necessarily, the problem of African nations today is not necessarily with the constitution of the states themselves, but with the individual citizens. For example, South Africa has democracy and one of the most liberal constitutions in the world. But it is still home, it is still one of the headquarters of crime and human rights abuses in the world. The citizens are the ones who will make the laws, policies, and vote in elections. They are the ones who will police their democracy, police their governments, exercise their 
their duties. Function in agencies and what have you. They are those who will manage state agencies and institutions. And they are the people who will implement the laws and policies. It, is, it does not matter the structures which the United States, World Bank, IMF, UN, and EU, or any of these crooked international organizations have helped us or compelled us to put in place. If most citizens cannot do the right thing in their various stations, then, as the German poet Heinrich Hein tweeted, we will sow dragons and reap a harvest of fleas. Name one African country today that is not reaping fleas from a plantation of dragons. If you and I, as individual citizens, cannot do the right thing in our various stations, there is no way that society, that state can make progress. It's not possible. There's no way. So in Africa, we are witnessing a near complete failure of citizenship. You cannot always expect to get justice from the courts. In some countries, never, unless you have the money to pay for it. You cannot always expect to get good service from public institutions. Negligence and irresponsibility characterize various offices. In some countries, members of the law enforcement agencies break the law more than civilians. General public indolence, lawlessness, and entitlement mentality pervade all strata of society in many African states. Business transactions are marred by dishonesty. Public office holders are some of the boldest thieves and shameless idiots you can find. If this is not a failure of citizenship, tell me what is. You ask yourself, how did we get here? My response is communalysis. The trauma-induced obsession with communalism. Most African scholars treat it with kids' gloves. They shy away from vigorously interrogating it. Others sing his praise and romanticize it and claim that and make it look like it makes us the envy of the world. Well, look at where it got us. The psychological category, and this is the last category before I wrap it up. I'm still within one hour. This category has, I, I have articulated them as regressive mentalities. And I have eight of them here. There could be more. These are mentalities that many Africans wear and carry around to whatever they do. Most of them, didn't, most of us don't know it. And these are the mentalities that enable us to run down the entire state from our little corner. We run down the entire state from our little states with those mentalities. Number one, the wolf mentality. You know the animal called wolf, quite territorial. Victims of this mentality manifest a tendency for territoriality through negative solidarity. Communalysis compels victims to carve out their own ethnic, linguistic, religious, class, racial, territories, and aggressively police and defend it like wolves do, against threats, real or perceived. Those afflicted with this mentality are bigots, they are racist, they are classist, they are xenophobes, and they are ethnic jingoists. They are national citizens, and this is important, they are national citizens with local mindsets. And I say that no nation whose citizens are imbued with local mindsets ever rises above mediocrity. Look at South Africa, for example. Somebody is, has money to, some people have money to set up a big company. And they, are, and they announce, they want to hire. And then by the time the hiring is concluded, look at the strata, the organogram in the establishment. Members of a particular race are on top and earning fat. Another race is after them. And it continues down to, you see, 
the race that is at the bottom earning the peanuts doing the menial jobs in the company. National citizens, local mindsets. You know what happens? You know how that ruins the state? Because you'll be compelled to put your own person where he or she does not fit in. Instead of let it go to someone who is not from your own local group. Mary to be sacrificed. The world mentality. It narrows and trains the vision of an advocate or adherent to focus solely on what they consider a community. Those who are outside of that community do not matter or even exist. Many Africans today wear that mentality. Number two, the self-abasement mentality. Those who are afflicted by these psychological symptoms do not recognize or tolerate merit. Self-abasement mentality. Because they do not recognize merit, they become irritated by distinction, leading to jealousy, envy, and malice. One thing that African communal societies have in common is the derecognition of merit. African communal societies emphasize unquestioned obedience. Merit for them is when you are subservient to authority or those who hold power. But true merit means, and I define from a dictionary, quality of being particularly good or worthy, especially so as to deserve praise or reward. That is what merit means. Merit oils the engine of progress in society. The African communal ideology does not promote merit so well. It promotes and encourages self-abasement. This is why sycophancy and pretension are common in Africa today. In today's Africa, it is the cause of our poor performance, placing square pegs in round holes. People ascend positions of leadership and power through sycophancy and surround themselves with sycophants. Men and women of Mary do not normally subject themselves to self-abasement. So they are summarily dismissed as arrogant and proud. Whenever you hear people using that language to qualify people, look closely. Those are people who have self-concept problem. It's arrogant, it's proud. That someone is arrogant or proud is not an argument. Is their own way of hiding their inferiority complex. So communalysis, the, 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 the third one is penguin mentality. Victims of these symptoms, you know penguin, they are usually of the same color. They look alike, all of them. So victims of this symptom want to see equality, but the kind of equality. They want to see equality in mediocrity. Anyone who refuses to level down becomes a common threat, becomes a common threat. Common analysis makes them campaign for everyone to be treated equally, notwithstanding their level and contributions. They are the first to observe that some are rewarded better than others while overlooking difference in their contributions. They are quick to echo the socialist slogan from each according to his ability and to each according to his need. Hello, how can such a society make progress? I give 10 hours of productivity. Someone gives one hour and lazies around at the beach somewhere else and then you say we should all have equal, no, no. It doesn't make sense. It's part of the reason why socialism failed globally. China and Russia and other states that tried to practice had to, had to bring in a lot of elements of capitalism to spice it up. Victims of this penguin mentality are quick to, okay, say that they are lazy 
and wicked. They want to see equality without excellence. Let us be equally mediocrity. They expect competition without winners. In today's Africa, communalysis drives the penguin mentality to stifle fair competition, eliminate difference and reward in economic, social, and political spheres. Number four, the fear of success mentality. Those with this mentality frown at ambition and hard work. If you are ambitious, you are their number one enemy. You know why? Communalysis makes them despise ambitious people for fear that such people might succeed. The biblical brothers of Joseph sold him because they were afraid his dreams might come to pass. Victims of this mentality also hate those who work hard for fear that they may, rec they may be recognized and rewarded. They want a society without ambitious people and dreamers. One of the goals of an African communal society is to feed its members and maintain peace and calm. Those things are good, but hey, where it leaves that society docile and without progress. For adherents, things should remain this way. Things makes, this makes it a, eminently consumerist. That is the African communal society, ancient one. Such a society does not usually plan to get ahead of its problems, prosper its members, and chart a course for the future. They don't do that. Planning and strategy are for satisfying individual needs are anathemas in such a society, as it is in today's African society. Where really do they make useful plans for progress and of the society? Which states do you really think they make useful and implementable plans? For, then there's, there's not. They book us plans so that they will find avenues to loot money. Imagination and creativity are abhorred in the ancient African community, as it is in today's African community, for they challenge status quo. Therefore, to dream is to make the enemy of all. When you think about your friends and your relationships and your life to this point, you must have seen several occurrences of this. You may have even participated and played a role in some without knowing That is our problem in Africa, many of us. Number five, the kill Nkrumah mentality. You know the SY leader of uh, Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah. This is inspired by the Odyssey of Kwame Nkrumah. Common analysis makes victims of, his, of this mentality want to plot and destroy anyone who is audacious and confident in their abilities and plans because they represent strong individuals who threatened them all. You remember the strong individuals of the ancient African community? To them, confidence and audacity are abominable. Thinking becomes sinful and is routinely punished, directly or indirectly. Enemies of progress backbite and find ways to undermine those bold plans and that actor. They do not rest until their goal is achieved. This is Yet another mentality that communalysis festers amongst Africans today. A thinker with audacity and confidence advertises the shallowness in the others because those others have self-concept problem. If you don't have self-concept problem, people are gifted differently. If you're a president or you're, you're heading a police or heading anything and there are people under you who distinguish themselves, you don't try to block their shine. You give them platform to, 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 to implode positively and take, and take the organization forward. But negative solidarity makes us see that person as a threat. And willingly or unwillingly, knowingly or unknowingly, we contrive and do whatever that is possible to undermine them and bring them down. How can Africa make progress? If many people, majority, think this way, how can these states in Africa make progress? It doesn't matter the type of resources you have in the land. It doesn't matter the laws and policies and the, that have been articulated and put in effect. In our different small corners, 
we will collectively pull down, run down our states. The states are not to blame. The people are to blame. Among compatriots, smitten by communalysis, envy and jealousy are instigated. They want and prefer modest plans and status quo and are unnerved by bold and audacious plans and audacious people. The letter exposes their incompetence and mental poverty, which makes them uncomfortable and irrelevant, and they don't want that. Number six, this is very important to me, the Muhammadu Buhari mentality. This mentality describes what has become rampant in parts of Africa today, reaching a crescendo in Africa's most corrupt president in history so far, President Muhammadu Buhari of Nigeria, that stepped down in this May. His level of corruption has made nonsense of Mobutu Sesisekos. <laughs> but wait and see, wait and see how the threats of these, the people that carry this mentality. In it, there is a pronounced phobia of merit and excellence. People who manifest this mentality find comfort in incompetence. They put a facade of empty bravado to mask this incompetence and make verbose pronouncements to avoid intelligent debates. They are routinely boastful and contribute no real arguments to issues. They generally have a very fat ego that is easily pricked. This makes them impulsive in action. Communalysis makes them bigoted and out of a selfish, ethnic, religious, clannish, and entitlement mentality, they willfully underscore that word. They willfully discount merit and sabotage excellence perceived as a common threat. Surround themselves with people like them and run the state down. Number seven, they compare a Yadema mentality. Must know the SY presidents of uh, Burkina Faso and um, Togo, both of them military officers who came to power by killing their principals <coughs> who were doing, some, doing great for their states. Communalysis regularly instigates this mentality everywhere in Africa today. The ousted Burkina Bay president, Blaise Compaore, who led a coup d'etat to murder his boyhood, boyhood friend, Thomas Sankara, perfectly manifests this mentality. What about Enasimbo Yadema, who murdered uh, Silvanus Olympio? And that same day, he went to the French embassy and collected uh, a paltry $615 as prize money for murdering the man. Enthroned, put the next man there, and have less than four years, organized another coup, removed the man. And from 1967, he was president of Togo, till 20, 2005, when he died. In, 20, in, 2000, in 2000, he changed the constitution to allow him to remain president for life. A year before he died, he changed the constitution to bring down the age limit for presidency from 45 to 35 so that his son would succeed him. And his son succeeded him. People who wear this mentality, they become jealous and seek the help of foreign and external partners to destroy the local heroes and usurp their positions. Those who manifest this mentality are usually disgruntled locals who conspire with external and foreigners to destroy local heroes. They are jealous, they are envious, they lie in wait like the green snake, beat their time and strike when they are victims, they are friends. You know, I was not expecting it. The last, last but not the last of, but not least, 
the African elder mentality. And let's pay attention to this. Common analysis leads us to associate age with competence and gray hairs with wisdom. As a result, the older generation with failing health and declining mental acuity are often given opportunities that young, vibrant, energetic people should manage better. It is not because people usually believe that the old are more competent and wise. They do not. But why do they do that? Victims of communalysis simply want to deny their more qualified peers the opportunity to sit on top and manage things. Why should it be him? Why not me? If I cannot have it, then he cannot have it. Let that old buffoon take it. They are more comfortable with having old and senile people call the shots than their peers, even if it means sacrificing collective progress. I was in a particular set, uh, African group of Africans. We were trying to make something work. And somebody came up with a brilliant idea. But someone who, who should have, who, we should be a big man, so to speak, in that circle. Opposed it with everything. Well, one person first asked, the, chair, the chairperson of that group presented this wonderful idea. Perhaps they doubted that it, it came from the chairperson. So one person now asked, ah, who came up with this wonderful idea? The chairperson says, it's important, this is a good idea, let us think about it and see how we can take it forward. I said, ah, but we want to know who generated this wonderful idea. The moment the chairperson mentioned the name of the person, who happened to be someone much younger, they have been, they've not been comfortable with. You know what they did? Another person entirely opposed it so much. And when someone asked, ah, but why? What is the ground for opposing this? He said all kinds of things about the fellow that created this wonderful idea. Things that are not really arguments, but outpour of negative emotions, baseless negative emotions and concluded with a statement that made me to tell this story. That instead of us implementing this idea, let us remain in our dark ages. <laughs> I was alarmed. But there is very little one person can do when the tool of democracy is abused by people who suffer crisis of thought. That vote it's yours by right, but you also have a responsibility to use it well. But taught by crisis of thought, you will abuse that vote. You use it the way you should not use it. How can democracy move forward? So, victims of communalism simply want to deny their more qualified peers the opportunity to sit on top. They are more comfortable with having old people, you know, run things. The truth. However, is that it doesn't matter how old one is. If I'm not competent, I'm not competent. It still doesn't matter how many, whether the gray hairs on my head number in millions or in billions. If I am not wise, I am not wise. It doesn't mean that even though age could count against some old people, it doesn't count against many of them. In fact, age can also be a blessing to, you know, raise the competence of old people because of experience. But let, but we rob, most times, place people like the, my president that stepped down uh, in May, very old, or the one that took over.
conclusion. In Africa today, many people subscribe to the intergenerational orientation that for our judging, willing and acting to be morally permissible, ontological, ontologically authentic and sociopolitically correct, they must defend the collective from a common threat. This orientation is not only regressive, it also, it's also, it also contradicts the liberal ideology that dominates Africa today. As a result, there is an epidemic of communalysis in many parts of Africa. I have demonstrated that this condition can be linked to the old communal contract. And when we rebel, when we criticize Western this and Western that, most times we are we are carrying out intellectual rebellion. Intellectual rebellion against ideologies from the West, against whatever that comes from the West, because it gives us this type of, it's a kind of psychological opium too. The humiliating effects of racialism, colonialism, apartheid, and the rest of them, slavery, makes us want to fight anything that comes from there. It's not all the time that whatever comes from there is bad or wrong. Let's do selective. Let's select the bad ones. And put them. But that's not how we do it most times. So, doing so I said that I advocate that various African co societies affected by communalysis should devise strategies for replacing the old communal contract, driven by negative solidarity. Doing this requires a new ideology to inspire progressive mindsets and a new social orientation driven by positive solidarity. These new strategies will become the subject of another talk. But before I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, let us undertake a simple task that might guide us to imagine what we can do from here. If you are on a journey of a thousand miles, and when you have notched up some 700 miles, you suddenly discover that you had been on a false route all along, what is the wisest thing to do? Do you press forward in hope that you will find a diversion to the correct route? Do you turn left and right, enter the bush and hope that you'll bump into the correct route? These questions compel us as Africans to ask the most important question, one that we regularly avoid asking. How did we get here? My people has a proverb that goes this way. If someone does not know where the rain started beating him. He is unlike, he's, he's not likely to know where the rain will stop beating him. Now, I have provided a the theoretical, philosophical explanation of why we behave the way we do and run down our states today. I've connected it to what made Asian Africans not to make the type of progress they should have made having formed the moment, from the time they formed the, com the community thereby leaving us vulnerable when Europeans came that made slavery possible, made colonialism possible, made apartheid possible, made land disposition possible. Do you know the murders and carnage and evil that colonialists had done on this continent? In Congo, they killed over, the Belgians killed about 20 million Congolese during their colonial time. But you, we, we don't usually see this in history or these statistics in books because they also control knowledge production. If you doubt me, Professor Madise is, can tell you about this. Write a proposal of a book you want to write. Submit it. Let that book be something that challenges any of this order. It will be rejected. So you, and you, if, you, if, you, if you seek funding to write it, you won't get that funding. So you won't write that book. And then your brother who writes what they want to see is the one that will get the funding. 
and his book will be published. So this is a book by an African saying A, B, C, and D. But A, B, C, and D that he has been made to say. So the final two sentences. Taking our little analogy into account, going back from that journey might seem like the most unpleasant choice if notched off 700 miles. Yet, it is the wisest choice. For what it is worth, valuable lessons will be learned in that tedious backward match. Lessons that will help us to understand who we are, where we are coming from, where we are going, how to get there, those who can lead us there, and the mistakes to avoid. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's put our hands together again for a moment. That was a wonderful presentation, and I, I can actually sense that there's a barrage of questions that will actually come the way of Professor Chinogam. Um, I'm going to now ask uh, Ms. Gugun Ndazi to ascend the stage for her to present uh, her response to the paper. Thank you. At least, Prof, we are bringing somebody young. We're not actually caught up in this. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Yeah, it's still morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, how are you? I'm good, thank you. My name is Kukun Lazi, and I am from the philosophy department. Uh, fairly new in the philosophy department and I am privileged to be standing in front of you today um, and also to be responding to a paper by uh, Prof. Jonathan um, as, we, as we've heard him um, this morning. Oh my God, as a, as a young African person, when I first read this paper on Tuesday, I read it on Tuesday and I finished it on Tuesday, I had different kinds of emotions because one minute I'm like, okay, yeah, I can relate. I understand, I see what you mean. And then at the same time I'm like, but no, we are trying to build a better Africa. We're trying to do good. As academics, we're trying to make it, maybe not, maybe, maybe not look um, presentable, but hopefully we strive to build a, a, a better Africa. We are striving to build um, a society that is united, that is interested in the development and progress of, of its people and, and most importantly of its young people. However, um, as I said, I, I went through a range of, of emotions and um, the presentation, the paper in itself, um, how it was written, it was written very well. However, um, I found myself in this very depressive um, state based on the account of, of the ancient African communal contract because I was wondering, is this possible? Could this possibly have been a true uh, reflection of how Africa used to look like in ancient times? Um, and that is what I wanted. I wanted to, to get involved with this paper. I wanted to read more and, 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 and understand um, this trauma response that um, has prevented Africans from progressing and from um, moving ahead um, in, in, in whether in, in, in economy or in life or any other uh, possible way that Africans could have um, progressed. Okay, so um, the, the, the foundation of the paper is based on um, Africa's condition today and the, 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 the 
Africa's condition today is the PhD. By the way, I did not know <laughs> that there is another PhD <laughs> that does not pull him down except for the academic PhD. I thought the only PhD that we know of, or at least that I knew of, was the academic PhD. I did not know that we also have a pull him down syndrome, which is a, um, you know, also referred in this paper as communalysis. So this, this contractual, um, uh, this ancient uh, communal contract um, is, a, is, is, is based um, on a trauma response. So everything that Africans did or continue to do up until today, this is based on a response of having engaged or rather of having experienced Africans who were strong-willed, Africans who had freedom, and Africans who wanted to do things, and perhaps some of the things that they did uh, might have traumatized others, right? So um, the paper then also speaks of three basic norms, the coming of age, the age of innocence, and the age of corruption. So when things go wrong, according to this paper, things go wrong at the age of corruption. The age of coming of age and age of innocence seems to be acceptable and, and it's, pro, it's, 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 it's beautiful. Um, it's maybe not necessarily progressive, but um, there is some kind of beauty to it. However, when we move towards the age of corruption, that's where the issues start. Um, this is where, of course, people start. Um, they were either taking over land, um, as Prof made an example of a big, strong man who saw a maiden from um, their neighbor and was like, hmm, no, I want. And because there were no other forms of, of there were no rules and, and, and procedures put in place, um, someone could easily um, go and steal that maiden. Right, um, and this is where the trauma responses um, and the age of corruption emerged. Right. Um, however, I, I I I wondered, and this was me wondering as I was reading through the paper, um, wondering whether the introduction of the ancient um, communal contract did it really only have these three basic norms? Is it possible that um, Africans did not have any kind of rules um, and laws that were put in place to make sure that people live in a society where everyone is fair and equal. To me, that sounded um, unlikely that there was no, there were no rules, there were no um, certain cultural um, norms that were put in place to say there are certain things that you can do and there are certain things that you cannot do. Therefore, um, the idea of just these three norms having been the only, perhaps the only um, norms that were articulated amongst the African communities, um, to me, uh, seemed to be problematic that a community of people would not have certain rules and guidelines placed um, for everyone to be able to, to, to engage with each other and have boundaries with each other. Um, of course, also, as, 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 as Prof had also um, in his talk, he kept on emphasizing how the ancient um, colonial contract was, was more about regulating and exuding power over, over people, especially those who are strong-willed, not just those who are willing to be, um, you know, to be controlled. It was mostly about making sure that um, those that are strong-willed, those who are willing, who want to go and do the things that they want to do and achieve, are the ones who are unable to do so. Right? But then I wondered, is there a difference between a strong-willed person who is a bully, and therefore we might need to, you know, have that person controlled, or um, how about a someone who's strong-willed, 
but their strong will is not used against bullying others, but it's about going to varsity and becoming a lecturer at um, UNISA, um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it about this strong will or did they honestly did not approve of 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 either or right um these were my 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 you know my my take on the strong willed individuals that perhaps you have two sets of strong of strong willed people the one who is a bully and another who's strong willed in a sense that they are trying to to move ahead, is that also still problematic in this ancient um, colonial contract? Perhaps it is, but that is a conversation to be had in, in this platform today. This also made me wonder um, with regards to um, women. Could women at some point in their lives, could women have been the strong-willed one and they were tamed because of their strong willedness. At some point, did we have an, an, an African society that thought, mm -mm, we are not happy with those ones. They are now trying to be the heads of the household. I, I, no, we cannot have such. Or there was never um, the willingness as the contracts would say there was never a willingness and the need to improve and develop our women into the kind of women that we see today, the kind of women who are sitting in this venue hall today. Okay. Um, also, just a, f a, f a few more questions that um, I, I also ha I have. Um, one of those questions was, um, since the, the ancient contract was about um, oppression, regression, and gatekeeping, um, how did we then, is it possible that we could have still had people who were able to who were able to get out of this contract, or rather, who were able to leave a society of this nature and be able to progress. And most importantly, is this kind of contract only unique to Africans? Wouldn't this be a condition of human nature and not necessarily a condition of Africans? Those are just my, my thoughts. Sounds to me it's, it's a condition of human nature. Um, this is how humans are, but not necessarily a condition of Africans. But perhaps, again, this is a conversation that we still need to have about what we have done to ensure that we progress as Africans. And where have we failed ourselves as Africans, therefore ensuring that we, we, we do not progress and we do not move forward in our lives and in our careers, in our societies as well. The author also sh shows his um, dissatisfaction about the romanticization of African communalism. So in the paper, he talks about it um, like how we, 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 we all know it, um, which is it is peaceful, happy, equitable, and mutually progressive. You know, there is no corruption, everyone is happy, we love each other, Ubuntu, 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 Gabantu. You know, that's the kind of, of the African communalism that we aspire to, or at least that's the kind that we talk about in our papers and when we write our PhDs, right? But then, is that really the, the, the African communalism that we have? How do we, ex if we do, how do we explain the xenophobic attacks that we've experienced in South Africa and in other, the, in other African countries as well? If this is the African, the African communalism that we aspire to, to, to see in our lives, how is it that our women are still being killed every single day? How do we explain that? 
how do you how do we have in our offices as lecturers and the people and scholars who are talking big languages and, and big names and bombastic words and we write about these things and we enjoy writing about them because you know it's it's cool to do so and we get you know we get recognition for it but do we really 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 live up to this african communalism idea and if that's the case then why are we seeing so much violence against children and women why are we seeing so much violence amongst the homosexual community these are just some of the questions that we i, I was engaging with as 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 um i was going through this work So, um, Prof. Jonathan spoke of three psychological um, symptoms that we see in communalysis, right? Um, and, you know, the, these are, uh, you know, these are a, a trauma response of, of um, the pull me down syndrome, right? Um, but I wondered, as I said again, um, could this be a human nature problem and maybe not necessarily an African um, problem? Take for instance, the wolf mentality. The, the wolf mentality is, is aggressive, it's territorial, it exhibits negative solidarity. The victims of this mentality manifest a tendency for territor for territoriality through negative solidarity, right? Um, so this kind of um, mentality, uh, it makes it, you know, the, the victims uh, be concerned about their ethnicity, you know, um, class and racial territory and aggression and so on and so forth. Um, which then made me wonder, apartheid sounded a whole lot like the wolf mentality which then brings me back to the point that I made. Is this an African problem? Is this an African condition problem? Or is this a human nature problem? Could we possibly say, no, it's not only just an issue that we've seen in Africa, but this has been an issue perhaps that um, we see in, in Europe and many other countries as well. Right? So, um, the paper, of course, um, as, 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 as Prof discussed as he was standing here, um, he talks a lot about communalysis and the, its effects and, and what it has done and what it continues to do. Um, and he then suggests that we need a new contract to replace the old one because the old one is not working anymore. We need a new contract. So he says in this new contract, the new contract needs to inspire progressive mindsets and it needs to prepare a new social orientation driven by positive solidarity. And these new strategies of progressive mindsets and social orientation would, um, would be the driving force of the, the new contract, right? And as we've heard um, in, in the lecture today, and I, I would think all of us here have the similar questions, and one of those questions is, how will the new contract address communalysis? How will the new contract address the issues of Afrophobia? How will the new contract ensure that people progress? How will the new contract address the issue of negative solidarity and move that or change that into positive solidarity. That is what I, I would assume that all of us as we stand here are interested in hearing more about because that is what we want to do. We want to find solutions. Perhaps we've, we've found a problem. This is our problem. How do we address it? How do we change, how do we move from 
you know, sitting on this problem and talking about this problem and discussing this problem into a more now into a, a, an idea or an approach that addresses the problems of communalists that we've discussed, um, which has been created by the old communal contract. And I hope as we all stand here, and, or rather sit here today, um, and as Prof responds to our questions, we would come out of here with an understanding and we will task ourselves with wanting to do better. And I hope that we will be able to not only just do better in our writing, not to just do better in our work, but we'll also do better in our communities. I personally believe in the idea of, African, of Af African, Africanism and the idea of community because I am who I am and what I am because of the community that raised me. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Gugun Ndazi. And before I open the session to questions, I just want to announce that Professor Nkosi is going to leave us. Uh, she has another meeting to attend. And thanks, Professor Nkosi, for being here with us as the mother of the college. And may you actually have a nice day throughout. Um, colleagues, I'm now going to open the session to questions. If there are any questions, you, you are the first. I don't know if there's a roving mic around here. Is there a roving mic? Yes. OK, let's, let's jump. Okay, the first one here. There will be a second question right up there. I will take three at a time. One, two, three. Yeah. yeah you'll be the second, and then there will be the third. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Mahoney. I'm from the And by default, I find myself always in the midst of this discussion.
Thank you. A second question up there. Thank you. Analysis. Thank you. The last question.
entonces hay no very short question. Where was the morality of the where is the morality of Europe today? We say in Africa is like this and Africa is like that. And even at the beginning of the paper we talk about how Europe has is so developed and is so wealthy. The greatness of Europe is only because of the enslavement of Africa. And everything that is broken with Africa today is only because of Europe, not because of the citizens of Africa. Um, to, 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 and to maybe just establish that point and, and, and maybe just mention my last remark, the only thing that enabled Europe to colonize Africa was the fact that they had diamonds. It was not because Shaka had no shoes or because Africa was underdeveloped. India has a great history of linguistic and religious culture, yet they were still colonized. Um, but, but just to elaborate on that, uh, it, was, it was just guns and weapons that afforded Europeans the opportunity to colonize Africa. And guns were not even a European invention. It was a Chinese invention. And ironically enough, the Chinese were also colonized by Europe. So when we look at colonization, it's not to say that the victims of colonization, it was because they were underdeveloped and because they were struggling to form a community that they were colonized. No, we must look at the colonizers. We need to psychoanalyze them. What is their problem? Why do they feel this need to go and subjugate others, to enslave others, and to do all of these different things, to murder, to rape, and to pillage, rather than to pin it on the victims of these things? If we, we talk of society today, there was mention of gender violence. We would never, and we know today that it is absolutely wrong to victim blame. Yet, at so many points in saying that Africa was underdeveloped, it felt very much so that we were blaming the victim of Africa for the sins of Europe and just saying that Europe is this great country that Africa needs to be more like. The problems of the world that exist today is because Europe exists. Thank you. Um, I will allow both uh, Prof as well as Ms. Gugu to respond to those questions. Thank you very much um, for those questions. Thank you for the wonderful comments you made and your question and his question. Let me begin with yours. I tried to scribble something here. So, um, your main question was, to what extent does communal analysis or the communal contract prevent us from leadership accountability today? And um, you, meant you used the Zimbabwe as an example where the opposition party are clamoring for accountability and the party in power are trying to silence things up. Let me begin by telling you that this it's not the first time this type of thing is playing out in Africa. If, by some stroke of luck, they succeed in replacing the government uh, in Zimbabwe, the party in government in Zimbabwe in these their forthcoming elections, and they take over, if they, are, if they do not move forward to address, to fix the people that includes them, to address, my own explanation of this, common analysis. They would again, in the next two or three years, be the ones who will be running the gold mafia. The, is it gold mafia? Right? And this leadership, the current party in leadership now, will be the one clamoring for accountability. They are clamoring for accountability. Although we cannot judge them now, but we can reflect on other states in Africa where these type of things, uh, this type of thing has happened before. Uh, someone who is suffering from communalysis is not, what he says, also suffering from crisis of thought, what he believes and says are different from what he actually does. In Nigeria, uh, in 2015, 2014, 2015, a certain party ran with the slogan of change demanded accountability, called out corruption, all kinds of things, and they took over eight years. Became the worst that Nigeria has ever had. 
and set the record that is the most corrupt leadership in Africa to date. Communalysis. You say one thing, you do another. One governor from a state in eastern Nigeria, uh, Cross River State, Ben Ayade, who's a professor. Um, his tenure ended this May, eight years, two terms. And he was being interviewed. The state, he left the state far worse than it was. In fact, the good things that were in the state when he came, he destroyed all of them. In one of the interviews he, he granted, people were laughing, but I thought about it. The man shed tears on screen and said that he had good ideas, good plans, but he became a governor, he didn't know what happened, and here we are. Communalysis. He was saying things that he didn't really understand and believe. His actions are driven by a lot of communal baggage. And that is why it is difficult for us to fight to ensure leadership accountability. Because if someone in leadership is believed to have done something wrong, what is our collective responsibility as citizens? It is to check the excesses of those in our, our representatives and those in government. It is our job to match, up, match out and use our power as citizens, protest, pressure, until such a leader is brought to justice. But why do, we, why do many people not do that? Hey, how can we go and march against our sister or our brother? Do we really want our sister and our brother to come down? Remember, he or she has given appointment to that man in our church. Three more youths in our church. These are communal baggages. By the time majority of the citizens have finished considering all these communal baggages, they sit down, they don't do what they're supposed to do. That is why I said that the African states are not the problem. It is us, the citizens. In our small local, in our small corners, we collectively pull down the state. We collectively ruin the state. It is not the leader. Yes, we know the leader who is manning that position and doing all kinds of rubbish. We now know that he's in, he or she is incompetent. We know that he or she is corrupt. Yes. But what about us? Who have a responsibility to stop that? What are we doing? We look, a lot of, look at a lot of considerations and fail to do what we are supposed to do. Crisis of thought. We are supposed to be Democrats. We have roles in, this, in our societies. From Nigeria to Liberia, from Gambia to the Congo, we have roles. But do we do the, perform those roles? No. Why? Communal baggages. Directly or indirectly. Okay. Now I come to your, you raised quite a lot of questions. Uh, the first one being a humorous one, you asked whether I also suffer from common analysis. <laughs> well, let me address it this way, okay? They say that knowledge is power. But knowledge becomes power if you put it to work. To translate what you know to action, you need something else. It's not enough to know. Any fool can know. You pick up a book, you read. If, if someone picks up this and reads it and uh, uh, believes me, the person already knows it, but can he or she put it to work? It takes one more thing. It takes enlightenment, and by enlightenment, I, don't, I mean deep illumination. Deep illumination that aids understanding. It takes someone really taking a decision without looking at others. Ah, if I'm the only one that changes here. So I stop benefiting. Others will continue what they're doing. And ah, let all of us continue. It takes someone who will decide on his own to change without looking at whether others are willing to do so. And as a person, I wake up every morning. You know my prayers. I pray every morning when I wake up is, let me become a better me. I don't go to church. I don't pray. There's no reason to do all those. It's not because I don't believe that there's some divine 
uh, intelligence there. But if that divine intelligence must have been the one that gifted me with a brain, and that's all the grace that I need, it is my responsibility to put that brain to work. I wake up every morning, let me become a better me. And I strive every day to do that. That's a personal journey anyways. It doesn't mean that I'm perfect. It doesn't mean that I am there. But I am striving, and I hope that you will strive too. Then, to the more philosophical questions you raised. You give example of African kingdoms and empires, the great Mali Empire, the Oyo Empire, all kinds of kingdoms, uh, Kush, the um, Sudan, and all that, who had direct relationship with people across the Mediterranean, the Phoenicians, and the rest of them, and traded with them, who maintained connection with Europe, the cultural, the, 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 the were archaeological excavations seem the um, lower Neolithic age of archaeology, for those in archaeology here, that excavated artifacts that actually show that some 2005 to 5, 000, uh, 3, 000, 2005 to 3,000 years ago, the cultural progress in Europe was almost at the same level, was at the same level with cultural progress in Africa. And then some historians will explain that the desiccation of the Sahara cut off because no culture grows on its own. There's always the benefit of cultural interaction for growth. Okay? I explained that Africa stopped growing because the connection with other cultures was cut off by the Sahara. That's one explanation. And I'm putting forth my own explanation. Remember, I did not say that all Africans were in some uh, in hearts when Europeans came. I said that there were uh, kingdoms, there were exceptions. In my paper, I, I explained it there clearly. All right? But even those ones, despite the progress they made, if we group all of them at a corner, the other, the rest of African communities will still be majority who did not make sufficient progress. Even these ones that made progress, you know, they do not appear to have sustained that progress. And again, I am not blaming Africans who were the victims of slavery while living in Europe. I said at the beginning of this lecture when I read it out that I will not defend, if I recall my words, the um, ungodly, depraved colonialists and slavers for the terrible things they did. I will not defend all those things. I said that. But I said that despite all the terrible things they've done to Africa, they, there's one particular thing that continues to affect us also. And that thing was something that we produced ourselves, our own devices, and I called it the communal contract. And so, I did not say that all Africans were, um, they did not make any progress in ancient times. No, I didn't say that. Then, you also said that, you gave an example of Medians. Yeah, you blamed uh, Europe. Of course, I blame um, Europe for all the terrible things they, they did. But I am trying to be honest, like this person that first commented said, let us also look in words. Why we look at our enemies outside, let us also look in words and see if there are other things we have done to ourselves too. And uh, that was what led to the ideas that I have uh, put forward here. And then you said that um, you said that something about um, uh, that Europe was able to conquer Africa because they had guns and gun. Yeah, the gunpowder was invented by the Chinese. Yeah, I agree. But I was speaking in, in context, all right? In the 18th century, when uh, the Europeans who settled in, uh, in, 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 in Cape Town today, stretching towards Somerset and the rest of them, when they found themselves in conflict with King Shaka, Okay, by the way, whose headquarters capital was around Bulawayo at that time. And Kinshaka had about 100,000 soldiers in his army. As at that time, 
That's a great, that's a mighty army. But their weapons, they are just spears. They didn't even have shoes. Europeans had ships because they had to move from Cape Town to the coastal line of KwaZulu Natal to invade from there, to come in from there, the first uh, group of um, emissaries they sent to deceive Shaka. We are coming to discuss and all that. Whereas the ultimate motive was to study, know about more about the terrain, know his army, their strength, their weaknesses, and all that. They had ships. They had guns. They had cannons. Their soldiers had boots. They had medicine. Their own beloved. Of course, Shaka had voodoo, which as is, is the doctor that cares for everyone and all that. It stood a chance. These guys were less than 3,000 they could summon. Shaka had 100,000, but who lost? Who lost eventually? It stood no chance. Why? Because they were far advanced. Imagine that Shaka had guns too. Let's say that he doesn't even have cannons. Europeans will not, will not even last a day. Will not even last a day. And all that. So that was the point I was making. And I was trying to find an explanation as to why Africa was so backward compared to the Europeans as at the time they arrived this continent. If they had arrived and found wonderful civilizations everywhere from east to west to central, they would have been poopdogs struggling to learn from us. Nobody would have had the time to think that he or she was superior to that or that person. It was that thought that I was superior. And there were no goods to trade on. That led to the idea that I could enslave. You must think about the people so poorly to the point that you think that you could enslave them. And once slavery kicked in, it led to colonialism eventually. And the isms continue. Thank you. Gentlemen down here. Yes. Yes, thank you, Professor Ramon. Um, my name is Ramon. Why don't we read from the Bible chapter 22, verse 4 to 6, which I read from the Spanish Bible? Thank you, Ramon. It says, Africa is dying. Many people in that place have died and still are not being rescued from the great. Thank you, Professor. 
Please, will you just one question and please introduce yourself, please? Question in China. Thank you. Um, but before you, 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 you uh, respond, uh, um, based on all the questions that have been raised here, I'm not sure if, but this will be my view, if all that has been said boils down to one thing, Africa has been domesticated. I'll leave it to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll try to be as brief as possible because I can see that some people are itching to go. Okay, so someone asked a very important question. How, you know, how, 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 how does the communal construct on the developed Africa today 
Okay? In other words, how can we restructure African economies today? The premise of my argument is that to fix the state, we must first of all fix the people. It doesn't matter how many laws we put in place and policies. It doesn't matter the brilliance of economic agenda that we pass at the parliament. It doesn't matter how much we have to fund it, even if to more money to found it, found fund it than necessary. In the 70s, uh, Olusha Gobasanjo, as a military dictator in Nigeria, uh, through his um, uh, Ibrahim Gambari, uh, described his um, regime as a, um, a regime of wastage. It was the time of the Gulf um, uh, Wars, in the um, uh, Cold War coming to an end, all kinds of military hotspots in America. So there was oil boom. And Nigeria made so much money from oil. And Obasan just re said that the problem that Nigeria has is not money, but how to spend it. So it's not about the programs we set in place. Every day in these African states, they come up with all kinds of wonderful programs. They bring experts from World Bank and all kinds of places. Some coming to actually guide, others coming to mislead. If we don't fix the people, nothing will work. Because somebody will manage the money. Somebody will implement whatever policies we have agreed and framed. And if they carry with them the baggage of the communal baggage, compromises will eventually destroy whatever good plans we've set in motion. So my take is that let us fix us first. Let us fix us. And shouldn't be a problem to get a plan that will work. We've got abundant human resources. Then, someone asked a very touching question. How do we reach the masses? Okay, now we have shared this knowledge here. This, this event was properly announced, but the hall was not filled up. If the if the agenda of today's meeting was to share money, the crowd in UNISA will run through the gates. Communalysis, we don't know things that matter. We don't know what really benefits us. We think of something, we do another. So it's not if the, the academics themselves and people who belong to the university have not even turned up to benefit now, so it's going to be much it's a, a, a tall order to even get the masses out there to understand what we are talking about. Yet, it is a battle that must be won. Yet, it is a conversation that must be had. Yet, it is something that must be done. Because if we don't fix the people, 100 years from now, someone will go and excavate the video of this talk and say that, 100 years ago, some people gathered in UNISA to talk about this thing. Can you imagine how it is still affecting us today? So, but it is something that civil societies and governments must lead in time at the level of organization and mobilization. It is something that you and I must lead at the, at the individual level. We must show the family is the, is, is the society writ large. We must, show this if we must show this in our families. The kids grow up to imbibe and learn from us. We take it out there to our neighbors and all that. However, every one of us is, has a responsibility to do something about this. Communalysis is just a fancy word. Crisis of thought, failure of cities, these are fancy words that describe real life problems impeding Africa's progress. And this allows me to comment a little on the wonderful uh, question that uh, my colleague here raised. Is this men regressive mentality African problems, or are they just human? Are they human problems? They are human problems, but they are African problems in a special way. If you follow the logic of my argument, the, the communal contract that was struck at the ancient times was precipitated by trauma 
and mutual distrust. That imbued that contract with negative solidarity that people only come together to fight off threats. They don't come together. They don't trust each other well enough to come together to build something big and mighty. And that slowed progress. Everyone was scoring on their own. Left off vulnerable and made racialism possible, slavery possible, colonialism possible. Those things now have created new rounds of trauma for us. And much because many of our people were also complicit in these evils. Some of our people went, were the ones hunting our fellow brothers and catching them and going to take them to the Europeans. Some of our people played and, and we had stooges and worked with the colonialists to make sure and tell them our secrets to enable them to conquer us. Because of the African complicity in all these things, that's also, again, a new mutual distrust. So we can come together again to fight tough. The humiliation of these activities makes us reject everything Western. And we're quickly spoiled to organize. Think of how many occasions that people have mobilized, different groups in South Africa here have mobilized, match the U.S. Embassy, match the different union building to, 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 to protest. In, South Af in Cape Town, the, the, ta the taxi drivers are doing their own. But ask yourself, how many times really have groups and people gathered, you know, that way to build something great? I gave an example. If you go to Facebook and uh, LinkedIn and, and all these social medias, those who are there, you see uh, quite many African brothers and sisters who have found themselves in the corridors of power and wealth. And I ask them, how many consortiums have they come together to create? Must the government be the one to create jobs for people? How many consortiums have they created to give a lot of jobs to their own people? It's easy to point out that that company is owned by Europeans and they're employing only their own people. Yes, that's bad. National citizen, local mindset. The society will not make progress. But what again are you people doing? They, they go to Dubai and spend one million rand holidaying. They leave two billion rand in the bank doing nothing. The money that should be creating wealth. We have to fix the people first. And our brother or our sister is fingered for this terrible thing that they have done. On what day of the office they occupy, and we just sit. Racial politics, national citizens, local mindsets. We don't know that these, all these actions, our failure to play our roles, we are occupying this small space. Our job is to attend to people, direct them where to go, or help them file something and all that. And you're not at your post when you should be there. And someone comes, and you don't even apologize. Someone is there, has been waiting for you for 30 minutes, has not received attention. How can you go to an office for an attention? You spend more than 30 minutes without receiving an attention. Do you know the collective economic sabotage that leads to? Many people waste a tons of time that should be devoted towards wealth creation, waiting to receive service that should come to them immediately. Sometimes you go there one month, you haven't received that service. Somebody wants you to give him or her some money, and because you don't have it, you don't go there. That's, you're not progressing because the system is not allowing you. Should I go on and start breaking these things down? We, in our small corners, contributing, pulling down the state. Common analysis. It's not an African problem, but it's in a special way an African problem, because Europe passed through the communal state. They also warned, if you, if you go to the social contractarians, um, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, and um, J.J. Rousseau, okay, you see how Hobbes described the, what he called state of nature before the formation of the first community in Europe. That state of nature was nasty, brutish, and short. People killed one another and did all kinds of terrible things, similar to the age of corruption that I tried to paint. But when they gather to form a, a society, Tops calls it a form, the dictatorial one, a leviathan was in charge. The laws they made was 
not only to prevent people from hacking down one another, but most importantly, to pave way for advancement of their society, for individuals there. I am thinking that the kind of community we established was not that type, with positive solidarity. Ours was with negative solidarity. So we actually work together, but only when there's a collective threat, because collective threats are able to rouse us, because that was why we thought, they thought in the ancient time they formed that community. And slowed progress. And then these new rounds of trauma and mutual distrust has also damaged us in this era. We must fix the people in order to fix the state. I think, um, okay, my friend here said that he told him that there's no xenophobia in South Africa. Well, xenophobia comes from the Greek word xenos and phobia meaning fear of strangers. Okay? And uh, it is taken by scholars in the context of uh, natives seeing people who have come from other places, you know, being, not being comfortable with them, thinking that these people are take, denying us this or taking what belongs to us and all that. Now, I know that some other African scholars have questioned whether what goes on in South Africa could be called xenophobia. Some have come up with the concept of Afrophobia in this place. Fear of fellow Africans, all right? And there are many people who would argue that that better describes what actually goes on here when people agitate that those who are from other African countries should go home and leave their countries, their country for them. Because they truly believe, like somebody said something about the masses, they truly believe that uh, the foreigners have taken their jobs and all that. But when you look at statistics, you see that that's not true. And there is no society that has made progress without foreigners. Even those people who are in South Africa, there are people from other countries who are in their own country. And I tell you, the way I am a social thinker, and the way I see things going in South Africa, if, things, if this rapid decline is, not, decline is not arrested, in 10 years from now, many South Africans will be would be struggling to run away from here and go to another, other countries. 10 years, mark my word. 10 years, we'll be struggling, looking for visa to go to other countries, including those who are telling uh, people who are here to leave their country. No country advances without the technical know-how. After South Africans of different races who have all kinds of technical uh, this thing supporting this economy, the next, in population and Nigerians. If they are all to pack up and leave, you go to your bank, you won't see money to withdraw. Economy will crash overnight. So they are demanding for something they don't even know the consequences. Why are some companies folding up now in South Africa? Because Home Affairs is not issuing visas to expatriates who have certain degree of skills. And they can't run their businesses and they are still supposed to pay taxes. So they close fold up and move away. You know what happens? Maybe there are 100 or 200 South Africans who actually have jobs there. They lose those jobs. Those 200 people are supporting another 1,000 people with their families and relations. They all of them plunged into poverty. So they think they know what they are demanding, but no one, people have explained to them properly. I believe that every reasonable human being will understand if you explain to them. And it's our job to do that. But most importantly, what is happening in South Africa here is not different from what is happening in Sudan, South Sudan. What is happening in Cote d'Ivoire is not distinguishable from what is happening in the Congo today. What is happening in Liberia is in many ways similar to what is happening in Nigeria. Little nuances may mask greater similarities, but they are eminently the same. Failure of citizenship. And we must have to fix the people first before we can fix the state. We've tried to fix the state for how many decades? We have not succeeded. Let us fix the people who actually run the state, whether as, in, whether as followers or as leaders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> Imagine if both of you are saying the same thing. The civil society needs to be concerted to fix the people and start to challenge the ills of, the, the ills of our society. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm now going to call Professor Mavande Mugisi to come and do the vote of thanks.
they took him in with pride. Full of seeds. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd like to first thank the organizer. Um, is Dr. Seki here? Do you have Seki? Okay. Firstly, I'd like to, to, to thank uh, Dr. Buyoseki and the team for identifying our guest speaker. They really did a very, very good job. So we'd like to thank them for that. Then Mufupi, Wini, and the team for making sure that this day become realized. We are really, really thankful for that. For the marketing team, for all the marketing you did, you did your best. Unfortunately, people can be called and end up not coming. Uh, but really, I can't blame you for the empty halls. You did your best marketing. And um, for those who have come, I'm so, so grateful for you honoring him. And I was saying, sometimes people used to say, if they were here, they would have heard this one. So now, because you are here, you have heard this, but uh, I, I was just tempted in my mind to say, sometimes when people are not coming, you need to go to them. And I was, when I was thinking about what our guest speaker was saying about communality, I felt like maybe we can invite him for 20 minutes, Coffee Hello, during the board meeting, and we give him 10 minutes. Because I think uh, 10 or 20 minutes, because board meeting almost everybody attends. So if they don't come to you, you go to them. Uh, because I've seen that this diagnosis happening in almost all the departments, al almost all the levels. But if um, we, we make sure that this message reach our colleagues only first, we'll be able to roll it out. So uh, our keynote speaker, I'm so, so, so grateful for what you, you have said. When you were talking about the issues related to, uh, you know, I was forgetting it. I can't read what I have written. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, for, but for how I am, <laughs> but, but who I am. So when you were talking about uh, the negative solidarity, that's what we are really experiencing. And uh, people are doing everything by all means uh, to, to, to pull her down. And you could see people will even struggle and look for the chairs to try and say, how do we climb the ladders? How do we climb to pull her but if all this energy which we are using to pull hair, I, I, hair, I'm not mentioning only one person. Oh, well, there are only many hairs who are being pulled down because they are hairs. I, I'm focusing on the hairs because it's Women's Month, so it's not discrimination. <laughs> uh, but that's why I'm, I'm focusing on using the, the seeds, the hairs, and whatever because of Women's Month. Uh, we, we are trying our uh, all we can to destroy the women who are rising. But if we start to say, whatever action am I am doing, am I doing the PhD, like pull her down, or am I leading our university to have a lot of PhD, a real PhD? Of uh, which is only attained through a positive solidarity. Because we are all here at this university to make sure that the academic flourish to their highest position, which is PhD, highest qualification, which is PhD. Whether you are a cleaner, an administrator, uh, a, a, a postdoctoral fellow, an academic, a professor, 
whatever we are supposed to be doing is uh, to unite and make sure that we assist people to get their highest qualification. That's what the academic institution are here for. But we are doing the positive, the negative one. So let's try our best to change and analyze our behavior. Whatever steps we're doing, are we doing the PhD? Or are we doing PhD? Okay. <laughs> so, but I just want to ask to analyze our steps. So, um, Prof. ways to say what you want to say, uh, but I would like to give you this as a token of appreciation, and thank you very, very much. So it's not for the first time you hear from us. Uh, we are going to make sure that in one of the board meetings, we give you 10 minutes. Uh, it's 10 or 20 minutes. Don't talk about a lot of things. Just talk about communalism, <laughs> and so that people can be able to uh, to diagnose themselves and see what we can do. Uh, so I really, really appreciate what you have said. Mm, Gugu, I, I think you need an umbrella here <laughs> because. I would also like to thank uh, our executive dean in absentia um, for welcoming us and our program director for directing this program so well. I, I wish we had more time. We, next time maybe we might need a day uh, so that we shouldn't uh, um, switch off people when they want to, to speak. Because Africa Speak is about speaking. Uh, the keynote speaker is just leading, but we need to, to speak. So the next one, uh, make it um, the whole day. Don't worry, we'll fund. You know that I'm the financial manager of the college. <laughs> so we'll find it so that we shouldn't really silence other speakers. Thank you very much. Okay, lunch will be served.